The second part of this module focuses on Lev Vygotsky and his theory, which is called the social formation of mind. Actually, I don't know if he really came up with a particular name for it, but that's what folks have called it since um, his death and since his work has been resurrected. resurrected. Um, Vygotsky was born in 1896 and he died at the age of 38. And then all of his writing was sort of um, put underground uh, in Russia. People couldn't, we, we didn't have access to it for years um, until I think it was the 70s maybe, um, we finally got access to some of his work again. So there was a lot going on in psychology between the time that he actually postulated his ideas and we were able to get back to looking at his work. So let's take a little, uh, take a few minutes to look at Vygotsky's work and see what he has to say about how we learn and how we develop. Vygotsky focused on the process of development. He was less concerned about the product of development than on the process. He really wanted to know what was going on as children were developing. Like Bruner, he believed that development could not be understood apart from the social and cultural context. So he thought it was very important to look at what was going on around children socially and culturally. And he didn't really talk about stages like Bruner and Piaget did. His developmental method examined the natural um, was focused on what he called the natural process of development and he tended to examine children using three different techniques and he wanted to he used these techniques in a variety of different activities he in, would introduce obstacles to normal problem solving he would provide external aids to problem solution and he would also ask children to solve problems beyond their current knowledge and skills and with these three different methods he was trying to figure out what went on when children had to work on things in a way that was different to what they might normally do, either because it was more difficult or because they had extra materials at their hand or because um, they encountered a problem they hadn't encountered before. And all of these, again, focused on, focused on process, the process of development and learning. And he also focused on mediation. And mediation is when the individual actively modifies their environment as they're trying to respond to it. So if he's introduced an obstacle in problem solving, then you would have to actively modify the environment to eliminate that obstacle. Um, if we give you something to do that's harder than what you know how to do, then you're going to have to actively work to figure out how to come up with a solution and to get some prompts or some assistance to work on solving that particular problem. Vygotsky drew heavily from Kohler's works with apes, and if you'll remember, we talked about Kohler back in chapter one, and we had videos of Kohler's apes using tools to um, accomplish what they needed to accomplish. And Vygotsky suggested that if apes could use tools, then humans also should have to invent tools and use tools in order for us to see evidence of human cognition or human thought. He was also a Marxist because he was uh, born in Russia during Marxist times, and so he had to acknowledge the structure and practices of socially organized labor and he said that these provided a context for how people think and act. So he was looking at how people think and act in the context of working together. And that, that influences in part of his theory as well. We'll see that. He came to the conclusion, like Bruner, that biological and cultural development do not occur in isolation, that we can't look at what's going on inside and what's going on outside separately. We have to look at those two things together. And those had some pretty important implications for instruction for Vygotsky as well. Okay, let's look at the importance of sociocultural history. Vygotsky says that the development of intelligence is the internalization of the tools of one's culture. So we can determine that somebody is intelligent by seeing how they internalize or utilize the things that they have to use in their culture. For example, as I was as a faculty member and somebody who teaches online and works at Georgia Southern, I have to use email an awful lot. I don't think twice about using email. Email is just something that I do on a regular basis and it just seems normal to me. And when I talked to a friend of mine recently who was trying to get some information to me and told me she couldn't figure out how to make something attach, it was really kind of shocking because I thought everybody knows how to attach. That's just basic email use. But in her culture as a stay-at-home mom and somebody who does a lot of volunteering for, for her kids' school and um, talking on the phone and texting, she hasn't had to use email very much. That's not a form of communication that she has to use very readily. So she hasn't learned how to use it. But I would be way out in left field if I couldn't use email in my profession. I've also internalized tools of my culture. I've had to learn how to use GoView in order to get your class going. And I became rather skilled at least at the technological aspect of recording videos, even if the uh, performance aspect is a little weak here. And the entertainment value is low. Sorry about that. Okay, um, 
Vygotsky also suggested that the degree to which thinking is context-bound is an important indicator of intelligence. If we can think outside of the context in which we're working, then we are likely to be more intelligent, as Vygotsky would um, suggest, than if we can only have our thoughts constrained by our context. Lakoff spent some time looking at diurbal, diurbal aborigines and other people groups to see how they classified particular things in their environment. And I don't know what these classification categories um, are, nor do I know how to pronounce them. But he found that the uh, um, aborigines classified things on the basis of their experience, their physical experience with objects. And so they put males, kangaroos, the moon, rainbow fish, and spear all together. And that appears to me that uh, we have things that, that um, men might be involved in doing men. Uh, use a f they go fishing, they use spears. Uh, maybe they hunt kangaroos, I don't know, but I'm just looking at that classification system. But all of this, these classifications don't seem like anything we might use, but it's related to their experience. Our thinking and our classification of these objects might be very different and they might be more abstract, um, more ab abstract categories. Okay? All right, let's look at the social origins of higher mental processes. Vygotsky said if we really want to understand how people think and why they think the way they do, we have to understand the social milieu or the groups or the, the cultures or the social categories that children are embed in which children are embedded. If we think, if we um, recognize that social activity is important, we have to see what kind of social activity might be occurring. He also talked about the process of mediation. And mediation is how we convert our social relationships into psychological processes. And for Vygotsky, this was important. He said, we interact with people, we talk with people, we do things. Well, how do we get those social relationships, our interactions and our communications into thoughts, into those psychological processes? And he said that that required the use of tools and signs. Remember back in the Situated Cognition chapter where we talked about the process of semiosis or the study of semiotics? And um, Vygotsky mentions this as well. He says that there are three different major, ca three different categories, major categories of uh, tools and signs. We've got indexical tools or signs, which indicate a cause and effect relationship. Um, that might be something like fire and smoke. Fire is the cause, smoke is the effect or the outcome from that fire. Iconic, which has to do with images and pictures, and that might be a picture of fire, or a symbolic relationship, which is abstract, where we might say smoke causes fire, or the word fire, that sound, and F-I-R-E, represents the hot, flaming um, object that it is. And the internalized symbolic mediation leads to higher mental processes. So as we take all of these things, our experiences interacting with other people and with objects, and we start thinking about them, and we start using symbols or language to um, represent our experiences, that shows the beginning of higher mental processes. Okay, Internalization is the process of transforming an interpersonal activity into an intrapersonal one. The conversation, the interaction that we have is interpersonal. The two of us are working on something, but we take that and we bring it into an intrapersonal activity where we think about things, and that's what Vygotsky t refers to as internalization. Remember Piaget talked about egocentric thought, and he said that egocentric thought represented a limitation on thinking in the pre-operational stage? Well, Vygotsky suggests that, in fact, ego egocentric speech represents a transition of things from the external to the internal. That is, we talk to people or people talk to us and they explain how to do things, we listen and we do those activities. But if you've ever watched young children and sometimes even older people, adults, um, engage in a new activity, often they will monitor their own activity by talking themselves through it. So maybe you have a child and you've told them to clean up their blocks and put all the blocks in the bucket. And the mom says that and the child's out there putting blocks in the bucket and as they're doing that they're saying, block in the bucket. Put this block here, block in, and as they're doing, saying those things to themselves, they're actually going through the motions of cleaning up. Eventually, the child no longer uses their egocentric speech to regulate their behavior. They can take the commands of the mother, put the blocks in the bucket, 
straight to thinking about what they need to do and putting those blocks away. So the external command becomes the internal monitoring process. Okay? Let's look at the zone of proximal development for a minute. The zone of proximal development is what Vygotsky identified as the gap between actual developmental level and the potential development. And he argues that children always function at a particular level. They have their level at which they can easily and comfortably solve problems. But above that level is a level at which they can solve problems with assistance and that we should be working within that zone. We should always be providing problems that are harder than a child can do on their own, but that they can do with assistance, but we have to provide the assistance for them to, to accomplish those tasks. And that's how development and learning occur, is by pulling kids further along in their development. Okay, So we've got to teach above the current level, but with proper support. What might that support look like? Oops. It might look like leading questions, it might look like metaphors, it might look like guiding questions, anything to get the children to work a little bit, to, to think a little bit further along with what they're doing. Um, earlier I was trying to help my daughter with something and she had some questions and I said, well, what does this look like to you? Where have you seen this before? What else can you relate it to? Those are the kinds of leading questions that you might ask to help scaffold and prompt the child onto the higher ends of their zone of proximal development. All right, what implications does this have for learning, instruction, and development? Good instruction precedes development and draw it along. So Vygotsky says if we're teaching well, we are bringing people along in their development. We are giving them harder things to do than they can currently do, and the instructions should help bring development along after it. We don't wait for development to occur before we teach. Rather, we teach to bring development along. Vygotsky also suggests that some interactions are more suited for development than others. If we really want to have positive interactions that will really influence development, then we need a more advanced partner who understands the needs of the less advanced. So our partners should never be working at the same level, but we should have somebody more advanced working with someone less advanced to help them develop to a higher level of cognitive functioning. We also should provide supportive tools for learners as knowledge is constructed. These are scaffolds. And remember I talked about just a minute ago, I said that if I'm helping someone work in the zone of proximal development, I'm going to use scaffolds or prompts, supports, to bring learning along as, they construct, as the learner constructs their understanding. So what's the role of language and other sign systems in Vygotsky's theory? Vygotsky argues that language frees children from the constraints of their immediate environment. What does that mean? Well, if you're sitting right in your environment and you don't have language, the only things you can refer to are those things that are around you. So if you have no language or symbol system, the only way that you can indicate you want something to eat is by pointing to the food that might be in that environment or maybe even crying because you're uncomfortable but then you still have to expect somebody to figure out what it is that you want but if you have language you can say want cookie or want food or want lunch something to that effect and so that frees the child from the constraints of their immediate environment where there is no food and allows them to um, talk abstractly about something they desire Vygotsky also suggests that play is very important for learning and he says that we, we need to give children plenty of opportunities to play within their environment and with others in order to pull their development and their learning along. Okay, there's a quick overview of Vygotsky. Read the chapter for more detail.